Hey, aloha, and welcome back to this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We're in the Think Tech Hawaii studios today. I've got two guests with me today. Jim Lind is here from the InfraGuard National Members Alliance, and I've got Russell Sini with me. He's the president of our Hawaii Members Alliance of InfraGuard, and we are going to be talking about the role of InfraGuard in the security ecosystem of the country. Um, and of Hawaii. So I think this is an important episode. Sit tight. I know we started a little bit late. I'm glad you're still here with us. Uh, Jim, I want to get you right on in here. Um, let's get a, a, a quick introduction, maybe as much um, as you want to share with the audience, uh, sort of your background, your history, and how you ended up with InfraGuard. Well, I retired and got bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before that, I was the Director of Intel and Security at the Communication Electronics Command. Okay. After 36 years in the government, uh, both uh, retired active duty and then retired uh, civil service, I uh, went to InfraGuard. And actually, my career built me for, for the position they put me in. Ah. Uh, because Communication Electronics Command was part of a supply organization that gave all the sens electronic sensors and communications that the Army pushes to the soldiers. Having been a Marine infantryman in my baby days, I thought that all supplies just arrived. <laughs> just magic. I thought it came. And so now... I'm a National Sector Chief for the Defense Industrial Base, something I had never heard of. Ah. <laughs> well, well, for six years before I retired, I ended up becoming the Director of Intelligence for that organization. Okay. And found all the threats that were coming to it. Ah. And learned that basically all of our defense contractors were getting a, a hit by foreign intelligence services who wanted the R&D the easy way. Yeah. That's what it, so I evolved into InfraGuard Perfect. Did, um, did, so did you get recruited up there by National? Or I don't recall if, if there's been a, a series of defense industrial based sector chiefs. Uh, I know we're glad yeah. to have you. I just didn't know um, how, how did, were you recruited to come aboard or, or was there someone already in that role and you were like a VP before that or? How'd that work out? No. no, I'm the first one for Dib. There, oh. the, last year was the first year they put. Uh, they recruited five for six for of the sixteen uh, sector chiefs. Okay. And now this year they've uh, in October I took this position and four others came in. Okay. Next year we will recruit a few more, but they're incrementally going through to build the program for the the 16 sectors that DHS sees as a critical infrastructure, which is outlined in a presidential policy directive. Awesome, okay, good. So Russell, you're, you're, you've you been president for a while now of the yeah, local four. members alliance, Hawaii member alliance. Yeah. Give us a bit of your history, background, how you how you migrated into your role. <laughs> uh, so I've been in computers for a really, really long time. Kind of like Jim, you know, it's like, and then I was attending regular InfraGuard meetings and I got volunteered. We had a cyber exercise that we were doing up at the university with the National Guard. And I got volunteered by two agents. Uh, <laughs> and I was voluntold. <laughs> voluntold, yeah, that's my favorite yeah. word. Yeah, I, I got voluntold to like, uh, go ahead and try and be on the board. And I figured that they were both armed. I probably should not argue with them. <laughs> <laughs> like, and so like, uh, that was four and a half years ago. I jokingly signed some of my stuff as president for life. I'm hoping to fix that this year and get fired. <laughs> like, so far it hasn't worked, but you know, uh, I, no, we're not letting <laughs> you go yet. Well, I think there's other hey, things I can be doing. Wait a second though. <laughs> wait a second. You're the first to have two co-chiefs in the dip. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Very few presidents have won, so yeah. you're way ahead. You're president for life. Yeah. You hey, you're not helping. <laughs> well, the, the the interesting thing, so you've, 
Um, as you've as you sat there for a while, right? We've, we've been through a few, um, what's our agent called? Our representative agent? Yeah, like we've yeah, had our, you know, like several coordinators. Yeah, you've had a few of those yeah. already, right? And some stronger than others, obviously. Yes. And we, I know those folks very well. Um, what's your sense of where, where we're headed locally? Um, you know, obviously, um, Jim's sitting on the national program. It sounds like we're gearing up with sector chiefs and it, things are things are coming together. What's your, your... I think the primary thing that we're seeing locally, like with the FBI and with InfraGuard, is... Uh, they're supporting us, and then because of our contacts with National or the Pacific region, uh, we've made a point of reaching out to both of those organizations or both of the individual chapters on the West Coast uh, to actually set up and mirror some of the things that are going on nationally or in the West, uh, West Coast. And then uh, we're feeding back to FBI of what we're working on and what we're doing. And then they're providing like support as far as what we need to be doing mm -hmm. uh, in case we steer ourselves off into the wrong directions. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time, it's like they're kind of letting us go and like saying, okay, let us know what you're doing. Uh, we'll provide feedback. We'll provide like resources as far as speakers and stuff goes. And that's worked out really good. For the meetings, yeah, I think yeah. so. We've had, we definitely had some good meetings. So, Jim, I, I know that you keep sending me out uh, uh, sector chief manuals, and I was wondering, is that are those going out to all the different sector chiefs that are signed up, or is that something that we're just kind of sharing inside the defense industrial base? Because um, obviously the concerns are a bit different, but the guidance seems applicable to me. Yes, and it's the National Sector Chief uh, Handbook. They're trying to put it across all the different sectors, not only ours and not only Hawaii. But... Something I found through the military and Russell put is that innovation happens when you let people run with it. Think he's doing things that our imagination may not show in the book. Okay. So not restricting and not putting a bridle on the horse, the horse actually wanders around and gets things right <laughs> that headquarters can't always think of. I like it. I like it. What um, what do you when you when you first got engaged? Um, what were some of the concerns that were addressed at, at the national level? Um, I, I'm not that familiar. I know InfraGuard's been around since I think it started in '96 in Cleveland, and then they got sort of national uh, agency with all the field offices had a representative. But you know, obviously, this has been what 18 years ago or yeah. something. So. <laughs> When you came aboard, what, what did you see? You know, obviously coming out of the, the well-oiled military machine that we all know and love, um, what, 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 what did it appear to you that we needed to work on the most? What I saw was that I joined in 98 when I came back to America from Korea. Okay. And uh, I retired from uh, the military. I... Joined in for guard in Washington D.C. at the time. Okay. And they were fumbling around, and they were mostly not working on the sectors. And really, the sectors came about after 9/11. How do we find a way to to protect all these or, all these different sectors? And I think that the sectors coming out in the presidential directive focused the organization and many some people complained that the early InfraGuard was only focused on cyber ah. and cyber was a sexy threat at the time okay. uh, if you recall that was titan rain in those days and there was the potential of chinese actors sure. who were conducting cyber espionage and today that continues to be our threat. In fact, uh, Director R uh, Ray in the FBI has said both cyber traditional and asymmetrical, using the insider threat on an organization mm -hmm. and hitting them with phishing and other things to get access to their uh, IT systems. Mm -hmm. um, and you know about the business enterprise where people are actually getting companies to actually send money. That's more on the criminal side, vice the cyber espionage. Sure. The biggest worry for the government, for our defense industry, is cyber espionage. Yeah. The espionage or the 
uh, coming at the R&D, taking away our R&D. If you look at some of the new Chinese airplanes, <laughs> wow. They, they look like ours. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Amazing how that works. Yeah. yeah. I know we've been battling that, that issue. I remember the, 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 the chips being found in the Boeing aircraft back. It's been quite a while back. You know, but I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think back. So it was, I think, 2006 when we first got a National Infrastructure Protection Plan. So by then we had, Clinton had been in, in for maybe four or five years. Yeah. And, or no, not Clinton, that would have been uh, Bush. That was after 9-11. Yeah. After yeah, so we had, so it took them a while to get this ramped up. And then we had another revision, I think, in 2009, Nine. then 13, and then I think 17. So as being around the organization, because I've not been in maybe four or five years, is has that guidance been helpful? I mean, do you feel like it's coming together better? Um, is there more cooperative cooperation and more sharing? There's obviously a lot of intel in our portal. I mean, I feel like the information's there. What I don't know is if we're getting a good sort of cross pollination. Is it getting out to the groups that right. need to use it? You know, it's kind of my my, my question. Right. I worry about that also, but yes, it has. It with the 16 sectors, and we're slowly moving that direction. We it gives focus. The issue is we've got a whole lot of recruiting to do, and I am a failure since one October out of the 82 offices. Really, we're at 12. Uh, wow, okay. And it's slow. Uh, um, sometimes you run into somebody, and you, and you assess them as a go-getter, and you grab them and recruit. Is, uh, um, let, let, I, let me ask you a question. Are, do you know how many of those chapters have as much DOD or DIB sector work? I mean, obviously, Hawaii, it's really big out here. I don't know, is it the same in, like, Ames, Iowa, or maybe that's not the best example. I know there's a lab there. but Oh, that is. Yeah. So, you look, the Air Force has stuff, yeah. and also there's a very large Army contracting office there. Okay. That contracting office has a whole lot of people with security clearances because sometimes contracts aren't unclassified right I understood <laughs> understood yes yeah, so I, I, do you do you have a feeling for how many I mean I, I'm sure it'd be nice to have a DIB sector chief in every office is there a has there been a, a prioritization uh, for from your perspective of you know obviously I think San Diego Charleston Hawaii to me there's these these big huge bases right um, with, a, with a whole lot of military going on and then across the country you've got different Air Force and Army installations right. Alaska obviously and, you know, maybe, maybe I'm thinking only in terms of the perimeters. I don't know. But um, do you have a, a sense of where you, where you have the greatest need? Really, I don't find any place that doesn't have a need. And the reason why is it's not just the bases. It's also the defense industry. And defense sure. industry happens where Congress gives money to a city or a location. West Virginia. Sure. West Virginia, the FBI's got a analytics center up there. Sure. Because Congress gave it to a congressman who really required something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if the if people think about how pervasive the defense industrial base is. You know, Hawaii talks a lot about tourism being the major economy driver, but our defense industrial base out here is is a major piece of the economy as well. Um, Jim, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to pay a few bills of our own. We'll be back in about one minute. Sounds good. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Security Matters Hawaii. We're with Jim Lint, the National uh, Sector Chief for the Defense Industrial Base at our InfraGuard Members Alliance. And we've got Russell Sini in here. He is the president of our Hawaii Members Alliance. And we are talking about really defense industrial base, but we're talking about InfraGuard in general as well. Right. So there's been a growth. 
Um, it's been around for 18 years now. Um, we've got the sectors defined that we need to work in. Um, we're having some good coordination efforts from the national branch, which I know you attend the national meetings and you go to the, the regional meetings, Russell. Right. Um, what, what, is, what is your reflection of what you've seen happening out here? I think what we're seeing more and more of is uh, our focus on when we have guest speakers in is to pick and choose, like, uh, like we just did a maritime one okay. with the Coast Guard. Uh, we did a tabletop with them. It was fairly aggressive, and it was done on an outer island. Uh, but it was more geared toward how do we leverage, you know, like the infraguard, the you know, like, uh, you know, like doing a tabletop, you know, the, like, the relationship, yeah, the relationship okay. uh, with the travel sector. Mm -hmm. you know, like, and that was the whole focus was on the like uh, not only trucking on buses and stuff, but what was going on with Coast Guard uh, in there. They had a specific need. Uh -huh. uh, and we provided you know, like a couple of InfraGuard people to work on their cyber areas. Okay. Uh, so we attacked uh, like a liquid petroleum gas tanker. Oh, wow. Simulated. Simulated. It was only simulated. A simulated attack, <laughs> sure. Thank you. Uh, but it went really, really well. And the main thing that we showed was the communications between a number of organizations, whether it be police or fire, uh, not only the FBI. Uh, so that was actually pretty good. Our focus on the meetings have been trying to pick a sector and get one or two speakers for each sector. Okay. Uh, have them come in and talk about what they're doing in their sector, whether it was the fire department or the police department, active shooters. Uh, but then whenever we can, we try and show the cyber component of whatever that is. Of those operations. Uh, how do they communicate with each other? Like, and just like, are there communications issues? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, does everybody have the same kind of comm gear? So when they're in a situation, mm. can everybody talk to each other? And there's been challenges with that. Mm, uh, of course. And then because we're tying ourselves more and more with the Pacific region, uh, we have a monthly phone call, teleconference that we do with a number of the chapters all across the West Coast. Awesome. Uh, so we have an hour of like, Everybody either sharing what they're doing or taking a lot of notes about what other people are doing okay. and getting ideas about what we could be doing. Good. And then also again, like uh, working with the local FBI office to explain what we are doing and then see what kind of resources they have available for us. Awesome. And we actually have uh, two of our past coordinators or advisors on our chapter right now mm -hmm. on my board. Uh, I shouldn't call it my board. <laughs> our board, your board, our board, whatever. As long as you can put them to work, it's okay. It's all and, good. <laughs> and, and I'm nominating them to be on the board this year. And I can just, like, they've both said kind of okay, which was kind of my response when I got voluntold. Sure, kind of okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking at being able to leverage their, like, past experience with the FBI so we can actually leverage more of the coordination of FBI's outreach into the community and also our community back to them like information flows. Yeah, I think it's super important. And Jim, you, you alluded to that earlier, the fact that, you know, these attacks are as much about people as they are about technology. And Hawaii, we have a, a massive international population that comes through here all the time. Often they want to stay and work, trying to infiltrate our organizations. And there's not a whole lot of awareness of, of that activity out there. I think that InfraGuard can play a, a really seminal role in communicating amongst those organizations that that private sector sort of government um, ag agency uh, interface. Yes. And you saw that in the maritime yeah. access exercise that yes. you did. So uh, let me ask you a question. We didn't have a maritime sector till you took that on. Is that correct? Uh, in Hawaii? No, not in Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> so, and the so, FBI was actually able to bring in uh, like one of the, for Houston, which has a huge oh, okay. like, harbor. Like, uh, and they brought in the sector, I don't even know what her role was. Sector uh, chief, I think. It was a sector chief for like, uh, Houston. Mm -hmm. And she came Port out and she, she basically like, explained what they're doing and things that they were working on. And so we kind of you know, like, took what she had and took some parts of it to you know, like, mold up mm -hmm. like, what we wanted to do over here. Wow. Jim, you know, that, that gives me a, you know, I know that in, in our portal, there's sort of like a, a, not a speaker's bureau, but it lists what you're available, your knowledge is available for. Maybe we need to set up a tour, you know, and get some of this information share kind of moving around the chapters. Now, I know you have an unlimited budget. <laughs> He's like, what? Did you take donations? Yes, yes. We're working on that in our chapter. Trust me.
One of the things that are easy to grab is FBI agents. Yeah. And uh, I just went to San Diego, and what they had was a briefing about the indictment of seven hackers who were Chinese who are now learning to live in America in a different way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Small box. <laughs> But the pr issue is, is that they ended up briefing the indictment and how they operated and how they were, how the hackers were successful and how they used insiders also. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in that auditorium, little light went off in the head saying, mm -hmm. uh-oh, yeah. that could happen in my company too. And I think that's where the bang for the buck in InfraGuard is, is being able to see other cases and then knowing what the bad guys are doing and how maybe we can prevent that mm -hmm. in our Yeah, I think, I think that the awareness, the awareness, um, uh, I call them presentations for, mm -hmm. for lack of a better verb, but especially when we get, because we've had CID, we've had uh, in, in CIS, we've yeah, had DHS, uh, DHS, we've had these when you hear the real stories, and they give you as much as they can, obviously not active investigation, but learning what's happened to others is a super valuable lesson because it's happening to someone else as we speak. And so I think this awareness is, uh, is key to one of the sort of foundational elements that InfraGuard can bring to a community. Right. You know, and it, the trick is we got to get, I think the people who care are, are in the room, but there's a whole lot who don't know yet, and we've got to get yeah. them in so that we get... You know, we get information going into their ears, you know. One of the ideas I saw from, actually it may have been Houston, uh, one of the other chapters was that they issued a, what they called a slick, a one-page summary of their topics. Okay. And in the military, we would have called it an executive summary or an abstract in academia. But something like that, that you can take back and give to your boss, that that FSO can take back, give to their office boss, hopefully to the executive, that is how you're going to get the information to flow beyond just the attendees. Yeah, I think we do have to make it valuable. And it's, it's, it's important that you bring up the FSOs. We haven't even, I don't think, really identified the tier one, you know, clear right. contractor FSOs, and I don't know that all of them in Hawaii are part of our community, much less, you know, my focus and passion is the tier two and three uncleared guys who really need as much help as we can give them. So, um, you know, I think I think DSS sort of knows these guys, and I, I know they're handling right. them as best they can, but, um, you know, we need them to share with us who's downstream from them, because we know those are targets of attack and targets of opportunity, those downstream companies, and so I'm hoping we Easy. can... I'm sorry? Easy targets. <laughs> Easy targets, yes. <laughs> I don't want to scare him, but yeah. And we're gonna, we are going to talk. I know you have some of your talk points today are going to be about the past few years, the right. things that have gone on. Uh, interesting, Jim. Today, after we're done here, Russell and I are going to give a presentation to uh, our Hawaii Information Communication Technology Association group about InfraGuard. A little bit of awareness, maybe a little bit of recruiting, but hopefully we can, uh, you know, in spreading what we do, you know, garner some more interest. I mean, it, it is free 99. Joining InfraGuard is the right price, right? <laughs> you know, why, why wouldn't you, if these things are of concern to your organization or to your, you know, the, the job that you have at the place that you work or whatever it may be. And also that the members get vetted too. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's, there's a vetting process, obviously, that they have to go through. But the application process is free, which is great, right? I mean, right. so, you know. No, I, but you still got to be vetted before you can become a member. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah oh, yeah, <laughs> by, the, by the members. And the yeah. U.S. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so, what what do you feel like we should we should strive to accomplish, Jim? You know, in the next in the next few years, specifically in the DIB sector. Now, we've got um, you know, we've got some guidance now. You're you're pushing. You got you got guys like me chomping at the bit. We got Jody chomping <laughs> at the bit. Um, you've got um, a, a, a dozen or so across the country. Maybe we can double that number this year and uh, get some more. What uh, what should we focus on? What uh, what can we do? What can we do to help the most? You think? A couple things. One, recruiting more chapter sector chiefs to help that chapter president focus on div. Okay. And find the speakers through the military, through uh, DSS. Uh, 
South Carolina has a DSS agent as their DIB sector chief. Makes sense. Makes total sense. And that worked for him and it worked for the chapter. So recruiting more people for the sector chief positions in the chapters, that's the first part. I mean, you don't need one figurehead at national. It's the people at the chapter who are the force multipliers. Okay. And then, so there's 82 chapters out there, and we've got a ways to go on that. Okay. Uh, getting co-chiefs co uh, is a real interesting idea because we tried to do that in D.C., and bingo. Obviously, that sector chief just got a great offer and is moving on. So they get hit by the bus, as we said in the past, <laughs> to prepare for getting hit by the bus. How do you... The, the co-chiefs is a great way to survive a organization. Okay. Well, we will, we'll be working on that. Jim, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I know uh, you're in a different time zone. I appreciate you taking the time out of your, your lunch hour to join us today. Russell, thank you as well, sir. Okay. Well, I'll see you in another hour. We're yeah. going to be back <laughs> on another stage. And uh, we're going to keep this conversation going, Jim. I want to get Infragard on this channel uh, maybe quarterly, something like that. But, but uh, as, we, as we make progress, let's talk about it. And I will see you at uh, National, sir, in Chicago, I believe. Sounds good. All right. Aloha. Take care. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.